Welcome to the Winning with Shopify podcast. This is the podcast to help you scale your Shopify store into a money-making machine. This episode is brought to you by Tidio, the highest rated live chat software on Shopify. Tidio helps Shopify merchants gain and retain more customers with personalized shopping experiences and automates up to 47% of recurring questions. Increase customer satisfaction and sales with personalized shopping experiences. Visit Tidio.com slash WWS to find out more and start using Tidio Premium with a discount exclusively for winning with Shopify listeners. Now over to your host, Nick Truman. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Winning with Shopify podcast. For anyone that's not tuned in before, my name is Nick. It's an absolute pleasure to have you tuning in today and listening into our conversation. Um, today is going to be our last episode um, with our lovely sponsors over at Tidio talking about customer service. We've got a very exciting series starting uh, just into April, although this one I think just snuck over the 1st of April, so it'll be a, a tiny bit later than normal. Um, but very excited to be moving to next month as well. Um, today we've got a very special guest, and we're going to be talking about a whole number of things, similar to previous weeks, but obviously every week we've got a slightly different slide slant on it, different experience, different guests. So I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Um, I've got a very special guest. His name is Ethan, and he is the founder and previous uh, CEO of Frank and Oak, um, and also the founder of a company called Rare Circles. So Ethan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Nick. Appreciate the invite. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us, um, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Good to have you on the show. As we ask all of our guests before we dive in, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, and also the fact that I specifically mentioned previous CEO. It'd be good to find out what you're doing now as well. Yeah, so I started Frank and Oak, uh, which is a sustainable apparel brand uh, with a high school friend of mine back in 2012, uh, really kind of in the midst of when D2C uh, came about um, around the same time that brands like Barbie Parker or Harry's basically were started. The initial idea behind Frank and Oak was very different than what it is today. You know, we, we really got passionate about helping men dress better. Okay. And so what really made Frank and Oak unique was a combination of not just a cool, affordable product, but combined in a shopping experience that provided advice mm. uh, to our male customers. And so we started out with that. Uh, I built a business over about nine years, uh, and the company was sold in 2020. And wow. I would say since then, I've been doing a mix of angel investing, uh, as well as supporting other founders. And recently, uh, I started a new business called Rare Circles. And at Rare Circles, what we aim to do is effectively take some of the learnings that I've had from Frank and Oak and some of the other businesses that I've seen in the commerce space and package that in a new strategy that you know we call community-led growth, which is effectively not depending on emails or not depending on you know paid ads uh, to grow your business, but rather yeah. leverage your community for both feedback and advocacy uh, mm -hmm. in order to grow your business. So that's a short description of what I've been up to in the last 10 years. Nice, nice. I mean, it's, it's an amazing journey. And I think certainly, as you say, starting with a high school friend. Quick question before we dive in. I love asking this where people have worked with someone um, or run a business with someone they knew previously. How did you find that dynamic? Was it, I mean, it must have been so different to high school, suddenly, you know, talking about finance and balance sheets and products runs and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't so hard in my case because we had already started another business together. And okay. we've always had this sort of like, a working relationship, but I always say that you know when you when you want to start a business, you know people say don't start a business with a friend, and yeah, yeah. that it definitely creates challenges. But at the same time, if you start from a place of trust, uh, mm -hmm. it also has a lot of advantages. So I would say I think the most important thing is for both to have a similar vision, similar values yeah. uh, in life, and to have you know effectively the goal be well aligned from the beginning. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's the same with any team as well, isn't it? Irrespective of working with a friend or someone you've known, you know, un unprofessionally outside of work. And um, the same with any team, you've got to have a mission and a destination of like, this is what we're aiming for. That's our North Star. Otherwise, you just find yourself w washing about and you're making decisions going, we don't really know which way is best. We don't know how to answer this decision because we don't know what we're trying to achieve. And so, um, yeah, really interesting. Really interesting. I'm glad I asked because, uh, yeah, we've had some, uh, some interesting dynamics uh, in the past in the podcast of, yeah, where things haven't worked so well, or where they've actually been the biggest strength or even where um, we had the, uh, one of the founders of Last Object on recently and she works with basically half her family. So I asked, you know, what's that like at the dinner table after a day in the office? But, um, but anyway, we're talking about customer service and, and customer success. And um, for the rest of the show, just for everyone listening, I'm not going to be specifically asking Ethan, it might be an odd question, but not specifically about his sort of new or his old business, which is generally experience. Um, and, and on that note, Ethan, 
talk to me about customer service or customer success, as, um, as those guys call it. Like, what are some of the key pillars of it? What are some of the things you absolutely need to get right? And then after that, we'll come on to what are some of the brands get wrong? And if you're happy to share any mistakes you've made as well, are always, uh, always most welcome. So. Yeah, I mean, I think in Oak, what was interesting is because we wanted to create this strong sense of belonging and loyalty from the beginning, uh, we call our customers members. And we always offer like premium customer service. Uh, we were very early uh, with you know live chat and, le- and leveraging live chat not not just for servicing but actually uh, pre-purchase. Um, yeah. We always feel that you know if you think about it, when you walk into a physical store mm. or into a hotel, customer service doesn't start when you have a problem. Customer service starts from the moment that you engage yep. uh, with that brand or experience. So that's the way that we define uh, mm. customer service or customer support. Our thinking is it's the entire journey and the relationship that. Uh, you build and that's why we call our customers yeah. members nice nice I, I love that idea of um i mean we talk a lot about how can we make the digital world more like the physical world but it's not often that somebody says that customer service should start from the moment that somebody actually enters the website but you're absolutely right because i mean i, I work a lot in seo and one of the things we always say about seo and, and, and ppc as well is um if you start with the keyword so you've got to think okay that's the challenge the problem so naturally they're going to have questions like no, I mean, there is a thing called retail therapy, but even behind that, there's challenges or reasons why someone's walked into a shop. It's like you were saying earlier about um, about Frank and Oak. Um, I want to look better. I want to know a bit more about fashion design and what I should wear to certain occasions and what works with what. And we will come on to some of that content in a mix. I think it's really interesting. But live chat, obviously, Tidio have different elements built in and AI chatbots. And you said you guys were quite early to it. So there wouldn't have been any of that sort of stuff back in the day, I imagine. Um, how did you find live chat initially in terms of management? Did you find it was just customers initially? Did you have to encourage and coach um, non-customers or not yet customers, as I like to call them? Did you have to coach the new users on the website to, to use it, to encourage them to ask a question? Or was actually it quite streamlined that people just, just jumped on and started talking? No, I would say like yeah, we didn't we didn't really have all the automation tools uh, and the chatbots and the AI at that point in time. But that mm-hmm. said, the intent was similar, which was to build relationships with our customers. And yep. and in that case, I think we were successful because we really focused on training uh, our customer service associates. Now, don't get me wrong; I, I absolutely think that the new technologies that exist today are much mm-hmm. better and, and are 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 easier uh, for brands to offer uh, a more consistent experience. But in our case, really focused on training really focus on hiring the right uh, customer server representatives. And then after that, having, you know, at least some form of system to track interactions uh, with customers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to ask a really, and it, this does relate to customer service because the person, as you said, on the other end of the line has to be the right person. What were some of your hiring policies? Because as someone who's hired, you know, and I have lots of staff, it's not easy and to find the right people. And sometimes you think someone's not great, but we'll give them a go and they turn out to be fantastic. And what were some of your hiring policies? Like, how did you guys, um, how did you guys manage that to get the right person in? Well, Frank and Oak, I think uh, the most important part was we wanted people that were aligned with the mission. Um, mm-hmm. That was the first thing. And the second part that had values also that were aligned with the company's values. Mm-hmm. I think those are the most important part. And it doesn't matter whether they work in customer service or in product design. If they believe in the mission, mm-hmm. they're going to be interested in talking about it. And so the other thing I would say is specifically to you know customer experience, I think really engaging um, the users and, and like not being shy to kind of make it personal, mm. like consider them as humans and, and not just, you know, as another number and another ticket to resolve. I think that also made a big difference. But I think what was interesting with Frank and Oak specifically is that a big part of our business was built on a subscription program, uh, which were these monthly, uh, effectively boxes of clothes that you would receive, mm. um, that were, you know, personalized based on your style. And that was part nice. of that, you know, Hey. insight around servicing the customer that created that there was built-in customer service within that experience uh where we you know we're always seeking feedback we're always basically engaging to better understand who our customers are and so i think a lot of that made it that it was almost easier because yep. it was built in within the experience wow and well i've got two questions and one's going to go on a big tangent so we'll do that one second um but the first question in terms of about making things personal um personal i love the idea of sending a box out that's personalized based on what you order, what we know about you. How do you bring that personal touch across in pre that, that step happening in both web content and also in the conversation on live chat? Yeah. I mean, look, I I think, I think part of it is of course you can personalize the experience and and I definitely think that's something that we're looking to do more and more. 
Um, but beyond that, I would say you can make a brand more accessible. And a lot of that goes into the copy and how you speak about yourself, how you respond to people's feedback on social media or like even in reviews. And so being really open and being proactive about it will help you to have a more of a personalized view. Now, it's interesting because this actually ties well into what I'm doing now uh, with Rare Circles, which is an enabling platform. And in that case, I think what's interesting is we really believe that for the last 10 years, a lot of the relationships were sort of merchant um, to shoppers uh, as it relates to like, you know, e-commerce. But I'm seeing more and more like the, over the, the brand's community getting involved. And in that case, what's interesting is sometimes don't ask me as the brand owner, what's mm. the right product for you to buy or how can you better dress? Ask someone else who's done the same experience. Ask someone else who's in the same community. And, if, and I find that kind of relationship really interesting in terms of driving even more, um, you know, interest in engaging with a brand. Yeah. And okay. I said, we're going to go to question two. I'm going to park that for a little bit. Cause this is really interesting. That community. I mean, the answer might be your new business. I, I, I don't know much about, um, about the new business itself, but how, what, what sort of, what sort of platform do you bring that to life? Is that a Facebook group? Is it just encouraging everyone to start commenting on Instagram? Do you need to put lots of money behind it to get that kind of thing to happen? Like what's the actual mechanic? Cause there'd be lots of merchants listening into this going, well, I'd love it if all my cost- customers were talking more. And someone says like, Oh, they didn't launch their spring summer range. And someone else said, Oh, I saw an email or a tweet saying this is happening instead and answering those questions. How do you actually instigate that? How do you, what platform do you use? How do you get people to start these conversations without the brand having to, you know, almost um, do it themselves or even try and even worse, try and pretend it's not the brand when actually it is? Yeah, look, I mean, I think the reality is that community obviously, obviously happens everywhere. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, it's, a, it's a very broad term to, you know, talk about your fans or your customer base. I think what we offer is a little bit different in the sense that what we found is everyone's interested in the idea of community building. Everyone wants like a brand with an active community, but then how do you productize that, right? How do you make that into a strategy and not just a a nice to have? And I think what we found is actually providing the brands with a brand owned community platform where they can actually manage their community members, where they can actually um, get the data also of like, you know, what's working, what's not working. Uh, is the future uh, and like a lot of people when I when I mention that they're basically saying are you saying that effectively each brand is going to have their own community outside of basically you know uh, mm. Instagram or TikTok it is what I'm saying uh, but I don't think that you need necessarily to not have Instagram uh, and mm. TikTok and some of the other channels I think what we're going to see is those channels will be great for distribution customer acquisition effectively getting access to new customers, but then how do you take yep. those new customers and turn them into community members and turn them into purchasers and then repeat purchasers? That's where our platform comes in. Nice, nice. And I, I like the way you've answered that because, yeah, it wasn't a just get everyone trying to comment on Instagram because then in a way as well, Instagram owns it and your and the other thing a lot of our customers have, um, there's problems with a lot of our clients is Instagram then owns the communication. They make one change to the way the system works, the algorithm. And I see looking at stats the other day that it's only about sort of four, four to eight percent of your audience actually see what you post unless you can get crazy levels of engagement, but it's unsustainable. But as you say, if you get them commenting with you directly, you can start to do things like email where you're the only one. Well, I say the only one. There's the other emails in their inbox. But if you start cutting through the noise, getting through spam filters and people are clicking on emails, they'll continue to receive them. We also had another guest on a few weeks ago, um, certainly at least one. I think I think two as well. We're talking about it in, in some detail is SMS. So we've had people talking about SMS that go straight into the inbox of your phone. And you'll probably be the right. only brand that's texting them today, maybe even this week. And so that's quite exciting as well to, to start building that community. But I think, yeah, I like, I like the fact you didn't sort of jump straight into the social one, but also didn't say, yeah, launch a forum on your own website. Um, I guess it changes by the brand, doesn't it? There are some things where I don't mind being part of the community, but I haven't got any time to give. So it's got to be quick and easy, like filling out the odd survey or and feeding back in that way, which is cool. Um, yeah. yeah, but I think, I think the beauty stuff. of it is that, you know, brands today are basically kind of like tribes, right? And, and to mm, a certain yeah. extent, like, you know, if you're into... Uh, rock climbing or if you're into like cycling if you're into like a beauty brand or if you're yeah. into cooking and like vegan food what you consume speaks a lot to who you are as a person and mm-hmm. so typically you'll find other people that have same affinity and so what i think we tend to forget is like a, a, one of the big reasons why people buy from a certain brand is because they want to belong and they want to hang out with the people mm-hmm. that are also part of that community and so to a certain extent you know i i've learned that because at frank and oak we used to do a lot of events and yeah. 
uh, people love the events and like the events actually became part of our marketing strategy. And yeah. now I'm realizing that with the technology that's available, you can effectively do that at scale online and, and make that a lot yeah. more accessible to everyone that even that can't make it, you know, on that specific day. And so yeah. that's where I think there's a lot of interest on, on the community side. The other thing I would say, I mean, I'm sure you speak to a lot of brands is that yeah. competition is basically out of control, right? In a sense, like no matter what you do, there'll be another like hundred brands that are more or less doing the same thing. And so yeah effectively differentiation will become a huge issue going forward. Um, you know, I think that like around when Frank and Oak was started in 2012, you could still be first in, in a category or in a product. Mm. Now you're competing with the entire world. And so what we found is community actually becomes the differentiator. Mm. Like who you're speaking to, how engaged they are, it becomes like what makes your business successful, not so much what you're selling. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I've started, um, and we used to do the whole exercise with advertising with clients where we say, what are your USPs? And now we just say, what are your SPs? Because they're not unique. It's just what are your <laughs> selling points? You know, it's like, yeah, what, what points do you sell at and why are you better than anyone else? Um, I, I think a really good example, and I know, I know it's the cliche, we've had them on the podcast, is Gymshark. Gymshark have their whole influencer program. And I think what, what's really true, going back to what you were saying earlier as well, hence my question about sort of web content and getting that message across. Gymshark, you land on their website and immediately there's a gym with people in it. And you're like, oh, it's a community. Just the first image you see, it's like, it's a community. Um, yep. And then Gymshark are also doing stuff now. Like they're doing, um, I, I, I subscribed to one a while ago, miserably failed my ad, but they're doing physical challenges. So you can go to your own gym, do a challenge, record your time, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think it's about building that community and getting people to engage. And I love what you were saying about the events. Um, events are so powerful. And I think whether it's, we often used to say in B2B, where it's lead generation, you've got, you know, you need an account manager. Um, people buy people. And that's really important. I think B2C brands need to catch up with that and realize that even on a B2C brand, like we're saying about customer service, the event is a physical thing. And we also had some guys on a few months ago um, with a new bit of tech that was basically like a physical event, but digitally. So they would have a physical event in their store where they would go around or in their sort of um, their studio where they shoot all their photography. They would have models coming in wearing different products and you could add them to cart. Um, oh, sorry, right. you could. You can add to cart using their piece of tech immediately now, um, which is really cool. They're called Ghost Retail. Um, and you can do a live shoppable video and anything you like on that video, you click it and it's added to your cart and you can look, view your cart later and sort it, change the sizes, all that sort of stuff. So I think it's really powerful now what's starting to happen. Um, and certainly online only brands, quite a few we've spoken to have actually started building their own studio internally just to do this. They're not going to launch a shop physically. They're just going to launch a studio to do it, for, um, to do it digitally, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, I, th I think different brands are looking for, you know, ways to differentiate their experience and build a closer relationship. Like, I definitely think mm -hmm. that one of the reasons why retail stores still exist is that, you know, the customer experience is different. And, and yeah. like, there is, you know, something special about going into your favorite store. It's kind of like going to the museum. Like, you can see paintings, you know, in, on the Internet, but it's not the same when you're there. So mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with you. That I still think we're basically in the first inning of, like, you know, digital commerce in the sense of how, what you see as a standard e-commerce experience today, uh, which you know a bunch of boxes and a grid uh, will evolve uh, in the next five yeah, or yeah. ten years. But re regardless of that, I, I I still believe that you know think about this way: like the way that you deliver experience will become a commodity regardless, because like whatever, like whether it's subscription, you know, whether it's social mm -hmm. commerce, all these things eventually they become um, you know commoditized because everyone starts doing them if they're working now. Yeah, yeah. You could make the same argument for community-driven commerce, which is true. But in community-driven commerce, what's interesting is it's not the tools that mm. make the experience. It's your community. And that, no one can take that away from you. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just on the community side as well, I, I was at a conference a few days ago just here in the UK. And someone was saying that right now, all brands are facing the same thing. They've got less loyalty. Lifetime value is going down. And it's all because there's, we're calling it in the UK, the cost of living crisis. You know, all the energy bills have gone up. The cost of everything's gone up. Um, interest has, has gone up on, on all borrowing, which means credit cards and Klarna and stuff like this. are They're not working in the same way they yeah. used to in terms of uptake. So it's been really interesting seeing that, to which then um, some of the guys at the conference were doing talks, with, uh, and brands especially, saying that we now need to be even more powerful to our customers. Something they didn't mention at all is what you've just described, this community commerce and getting the community to drive this thing. They were all talking about how they can communicate as a brand back to consumer. 
But actually what you're talking about is exactly what we need right now. You know, the brand that's going to support you through this time is the one that you're probably going to continue buying from as opposed to just the one that's shouting the loudest or has the best discounts or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Change, yeah. Like if, yeah. you, if you started a brand, you know, obviously it's your baby, you love it. But I would bet that there's someone out there that loves your brand more than you love your brand. True. Right? Yeah. So why, why not find a way to empower them to speak and, and become advocate for the brand? Now, I think what's challenging with community strategies is like the, the reason why, you know, like email or SMS and, or even like social media marketing have really taken off is because you have, you have a clear feedback loop, right? You know what's the open rate, you know what's the click-through rate, you know the yeah. revenue you generated through those channels. And I think one of the challenges when we speak about community is that it just seems so like, you know, fluffy, right? It's like, what yeah. does that mean? How do I know that I'm making money? It's very qualitative, isn't it? Versus exactly. Is, yeah. so, so I think that's part of the reason why uh, a lot of people are, they, they know they, they know it's important, but they don't really want to invest because like, well, I need to survive, right? So why would I invest in my community? And, and, yeah. and that's something that we're looking to solve, uh, which is to giving you the actual data and the feedback loop so you know what's working. But, you know, going back to your first point, like, absolutely, I think, obviously, we're, we're in this state, wh whether you call it a recession or not, we're in this sort of like, uncertain times right yeah. where no one has any money that's we don't really know <laughs> inflation is high everyone's scared about the future and i think yeah. there's a lot of concern about what's going to happen and at the same time you know like the cost of acquisition on social media channels or even like you know google and paid channels mm -hmm. have increased and so you're getting this double whammy and to be honest like i i mean i i'm invested in quite a few brands i have you know friends are running brands a lot of people are having a hard time right now um, yeah. and Part of it is that this sort of mechanical way of getting customers is just not working anymore. So absolutely, I think yeah. what, what I like about the idea of community also is when you say we need to create a stronger relationship with our customer, mm -hmm. often when people think about that, they think about things that will end up costing them money. And like the yeah. problem is, well, if you don't have any money as a brand right now because everything is getting more expensive, well, how do you do? I think it's more about a philosophy and changing the way you approach your customer base yeah. and then starting from that and then adding more initiatives. I just need to plug my computer. I know you just recorded <laughs> that, but it's a real need. I don't want you to die. It's fine. This is this is a real raw podcast. We're all good. We're all good. There it is. All right. Um, yeah. So that that's why I think like right now, community is more important mm -hmm. than ever. The other thing I would say is you know in in times of hardship, the reality mm -hmm. is that you know you know like back back in the days. And when I say back in the days, obviously I wasn't around in those days. But <laughs> there, there used to be this, this idea of like you know, the, 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 the main street, the kind of town square, right? In every small mm. town. And like you had your favorite store and you would support them because you knew them. Yep. And I think when we went into e-commerce, that kind of like relationship got lost a little bit, mm. right? Where yeah. it was like, because you're one click away from another bathing suit or from another, whatever you're looking to buy, mm. you lost that relationship. What mm. I think is needs to happen and will likely happen in the next 10 years, that relationship will come back because... Once again, that relationship that you have with the customer may be your only point of differentiation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And interestingly, I mean, I've just written down a quick note. I've written the word COVID because actually during COVID, the high street selling in the UK came back to life because we was, I mean, certainly when, for example, when you could only go to the supermarket, like we're talking sort of month four, month five. Yeah. In the UK, we, we could only go to the supermarket. You could only see friends for half an hour and you had to stand two meters apart and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's all very complicated and all very sad. But as soon as the restaurants opened, um, everybody up and down, you know, up and down the entire country here, and it was the same in the US, same across Europe, same in Australia and the Middle East. Everybody suddenly was like, well, I can order food from my local takeaway. And we, we actually discovered all our new favorite takeaways during COVID because we were yeah. like, we can cook at home, but that's all we've got these days. Let's do something special. We'll eat in the garden. Or when we were allowed out, we'd like literally pick up a takeaway from the local restaurant going, we've not tried this one. local Because you couldn't go in because of COVID. Yeah. You couldn't be in a closed room. So that started to come back to life, which I think was really exciting. Um, I want to jump back to something which is a lot less qualitative than this. And it's the opposite of qualitative and it's quantitative. You said that you guys are trying to, you're trying to help with, uh, I've written down the word attribution. You're trying to help with the attribution of how important the community is. You know what I'm going to ask, how, why, how are you guys looking to achieve that? What are some of the things you can actually note down? What are some of the numbers, the systems you can use to go, okay, we started telling our community to go and talk about us more and encouraging VIP customers. How do you track those kind of things? Yeah, I mean, look, I think, I think at first it starts with engagement. Uh, and so it's similar to like on the email okay. side, you know, open rate and click-through rate. So the, the first thing is to see how engaged your community is. I mean, even, you know, when people look at 
uh, you know, Instagram and Facebook, yeah. the numbers of followers don't matter. The ones that are engaged is what matters, right? So mm-hmm. I think the first thing is engagement. But beyond engagement, obviously, what everyone wants to know is like how does it tie back to revenue? And so in yeah. that case, what we're doing basically is thinking of community initiatives as campaigns and then mm-hmm. giving you the feedback loop around like, if you did an event, if you had like a talk, if you had like an online AMA, how many people attended and what kind of revenue is driven by those people that attended. And so effectively thinking of like community initiatives as campaigns and tying it back to engagement and revenue data is sort of what we're working on. Now, it's definitely more challenging. You know, like I, I think that like hmm. what one thing that I always tell people is like the the drug of paid ads, right? Effectively, whether it's Google and Facebook a lot of that has been created because of the feedback loop that those, those companies have created. And, and they were very smart in the sense of like, yeah. they give you so much customization and they give you so, such like amount of data, you feel like you have a chance of winning against basically uh, you know, the game. And you do, but the reality is that that chance is much smaller today than it used to be. And yeah. so creating the right feedback loop in terms of data is really important uh, because otherwise you don't know where you would invest. And I, mm-hmm. like I... I was in a position when I started my brand like, you know, 12 years ago now where we didn't have any money. And so if you had told me, hey, you have to buy this platform, you have to invest money here, I would have said, are you crazy? There's no there's no money to do that. And so or prove to me that it will actually generate positive return. I think that's really important. But effectively, yes, it's turning into campaigns and providing the right data in the feedback loop uh, to justify investing Mm -hmm. further. I think that makes a lot of sense. And. One thing I think is really interesting is you've just you just said to prove to me it's working, and that is a classic. It, and it's not the wrong question, but it's very unanswerable, certainly with more qualitative things. So if I said, all right, we're going to run this um, event, and we're going to invite a thousand people and see a digital event, how many, and let's see how many people turn up, how many people buy. If if the client or the decision maker in that scenario turned around and said, I can't sign this off and approve this unless I know how much money it's going to make. You can't answer that question. You've no idea. And also the, the worst thing of all of this, I say the worst, it's becoming more of a strength as we're talking about. One of the worst things um, on the face of it is humans are irrational. We're all emotional. We don't know why we do stuff. You catch the same human, they could visit your site five times and buy four of the times, but not the fifth. Why not? The fifth was the same time as another time. Like, why didn't they buy from me that fifth time? And obviously in the reality, it's more like 99% of the time they didn't buy from me. Um, and he's trying to get them to convert. But I do think the... The way we've changed that is we, we just, it's very simple. We just call it test and learn. We just put things in buckets of like, it's, this is PPC. We know what our conversion rate is. We know what our click costs. Therefore, we know if we set X daily budget, we're going to get this much revenue and this is the target. Let's go. But if we can't do that, it's test and learn. So we let's test something. Let's run our first event. Yeah. And interestingly, there's a big, um, again, I heard, um, I heard in a, a blog post reading recently, there's a couple of big brand managers in the UK who look after some, a couple of the biggest brands here, and there's, well, there's one in the US as well. Um, and all three of them were discussing something I read on this blog post, was sitting on a panel at a conference, and they all said that one of the biggest challenges for them is they don't know when people are going to click, they don't know when they're going to come back, they don't know how irrational these people are, so we need to have a bit of an always-on policy. And one of them in particular then said, we started running Facebook Lives, and we ran one once um, in a week. Bear in mind, they, they might have like 20 to $30 million going through their site every month. And they had 100 people or something turn up. It was a complete disaster on the face of it. And someone up high said, right, don't do that again. Delete it. Don't let anybody find that. That was a complete catastrophe. And they said, ah, but there was only 100 people. But since 400 people have watched it, so we're now up to 500. Let's yeah. leave it there. And they begged and begged and begged, like, right, we're going to run one next week. They ran one the second week, and they had 200 people there. And it was like, okay, fine. By the 20th one, they had nearly 100,000 people tuning into these Facebook Lives. The point being is they had no proof it was ever going to work. Most people in their Facebook audience, like I said earlier, don't see it because the algorithms don't show everything to everyone. But the, the fact is they kept working at it and chopping and changing it. And certainly with something more qualitative, like, as, as you say, like trying to create some sort of campaign or incentive for a community, it's going to take time to get it right. And I, I guess as well, as you say, you might be able to track all these metrics, but they might also all just type your brand name into Google at some point in the next three months and buy their product and you're not going to be able to track the two. So there is an element here of just test and learn, isn't it? There's a, we need a bit of an always on policy where we know our customers are hanging out and they want to talk to us. Yeah, de- definitely test and learn. I think like I agree with you that like most, most great strategies don't work right away. You know, you can't expect something just to like work right away. I think you have to, first of all, you have to build your audience, but second of all, like you also have to learn and test what's working and what's not. 
I, I would say that, uh, and, and that's why I go back to the, you know, the, what I call it like the drug of like paid ads is that because I like that. back in, you know, in the last 10 years, like the simple formula was always like, oh, there's just like hire an agency and put some ads. And <laughs> that always seemed like the easier solution and everything mm-hmm. else seems harder. But the reality is that it's actually the opposite. And, and, and it's just, there's this feeling that it's easier, but it's actually harder. And all these things that are, you know, wh- where I do get challenged, I think a lot of speak about it is they'll, they'll say, oh, well, you know, the, the, the online events or a community is not scalable. How do you scale that? And I, I would, I completely disagree because going back to the example, like Jim Shark or like even a brand like Lululemon, they, they've scaled their experiences to a level that, that effectively supports a billion dollar businesses. And so I think it's definitely scalable, but you need to have the right teams and the right tools in place to do that. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, like I said, the thing I write down with all of this is attribution, how to attribute this stuff. It's interesting that the more the more and more I talk to successful Shopify stores at the moment, the more they're saying attribution is a dirty word. We don't we will not listen to that. It's an always on policy. Are people engaging with us through each channel? If yes, although Google Analytics or GA4, which, yes, we're going to do a few episodes on that, everybody. So don't panic. Um, But GA4, for example, it will put it all in the direct channel because people are returning direct to buy. But it's like. Yeah, it's always that thing of, you know, John Wanamaker famously said, half my marketing budget's wasted, I just don't know which half. And so I certainly think it's, it, it is a challenge for marketers, and we hear you, but the more and more I'm hearing re- uh, recently, and, and it's probably going to get um, more severe this way, is a, we just, as long as we break even or don't make too much of a loss on our paid ad channels and focus a lot of, a lot of money and time on our website, our communities, our communication, our messaging, like you said right at the start about staff, our mission as well, um, yeah, as long as we're focusing on those things, we know we're going to make the money back. Which also, for as a marketeer, it's a dream for me. It's like you can make one to one revenue. It's like oh, fantastic! Um, you know, we normally charge for sort of ten or twenty to one, which uh, which is a lot more difficult. Um, but I guess a, a good good point to kind of close off. And I know we've spoken about this a little bit, um, Ethan. But what are some of your predictions going forward? What do you think is going to change with brands? Obviously, we're looking towards more communal. How much do you think AI is going to play a part? That's a bit of a bit of a hot potato at the moment with Chat GPT and Bard launching and how much do you think AI is going to be involved? Do you think there's any other big factors coming? Like, obviously, you can't predict a p- pandemic, but is there anything we're aware of at the moment that it's probably going to change the face of customer communication? Yeah, look, I mean, I, there's a few things I predict. I, I actually think that AI is going to make the competition even harder. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and the reason why is because AI is going to be widely available. Most tools that you use from Shopify to, like, you know, a, a live chat mm-hmm. tool or, like, an intercom or whatever you're using will we'll integrate AI, and they're already doing it. And so what's going to happen yeah. is that the customer service that you thought you could give, all of a sudden everyone can do it with AI, yeah. even though you had better training and better staff. And so yeah. I think that like definitely, uh, you know, brands should embrace uh, tools that have AI included. They should try to get more insight about their customers through AI. But at the same time, you have to assume that within two or three years, everyone's going to have it. And so I am kind of like more old school uh, in the sense that I believe that from a, as a brand founder or, or someone who's building an e-commerce business, really thinking about like how do you uniquely create a relationship with your customers and how do you like foster and grow that relationship over time matters. And that's why like part of my predictions, I think that, you know, niche brands, niche communities are going to have tremendous amount of success. If you think about a, a very niche product with a niche brand, but you do it globally, it can still be a very, very big business. So that's one of my uh, predictions. I think that we're going to see more and more, uh, you know, creator led uh, brands. We're already seeing that. And the reason why those are interesting it's not so much about like, oh, I have a million followers on Instagram, but it's more about the fact that there's a unique personality. People are not just buying from a mm. random brand with no face and no name. They're buying from you because they, they know you or they feel like they know you. And so I think that's another trend. The, the last piece I would say is I think omni-channel is going to continue being big, meaning that people, yes, are going to continue selling through Shopify, but also through social. They're going to be selling through marketplaces. And so I just think that like, just like a content creator, you don't just have one channel. I think as a brand, you have to look at all your different channels. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, omni-channel, I first heard that word like 10 years ago. And yeah. you're absolutely, if you look at the pr- previous trajectory, um, obviously we don't know what's going to happen, but I would completely agree with you. It's, it's, it's going up and up and up. I think one of the biggest challenges with omni-channel is if you're starting your brand at the moment and you're sitting there going, omni-channel is just terrifying. Like I'm barely getting my Google ads up and I've got no one on Facebook and... We're struggling here. Um, One of the good things to remember is you almost want to sort of, this is just my view, I'd be interested to hear your view as well on this, Ethan, but my view is you you, you want to pick your fights with it. 
So we as, we as an agency, we're on LinkedIn and nothing else. Yep. The podcast is on, which is a lovely little plug, it's on TikTok and Instagram and stuff now because actually that's where a lot of you guys are, our listeners. That's where you want to hear from us. That's where you want to engage with us. And we want to engage more. And actually the traditional fill out a form on our website, send us an email. Although we ask that, we get good responses. That's not, that's certainly not anywhere near as good as actually watching a YouTube short. And I see that in the data as to how many people watch our YouTube shorts. So I think there's an element of pick your battles because things like Snapchat have disappeared. MySpace is gone. Uh, you remember Google Plus? When everyone, if you want to be number one on SEO, you've got to have a Google Plus. That's gone. Um, <laughs> yeah. And TikTok. I mean, right now, you know, US government officials aren't allowed to use TikTok. The UK is talking about stopping it altogether. Um, it might be gone tomorrow. Um, Pinterest, I would argue, is one of the best and most awesome platforms, but not a lot of people use it compared to the other ones. So I think certainly with Omnichannel, it's picking your battles. And I guess it'd be interesting to hear your view on this, Ethan, because my view, and I'm not a brand owner, but I'm a marketeer, my view would be just sort of go one at a time and do them, do them properly and do them well and get them up and running. You know, try and attribute the value as much as you can to justify the investment. But I mean, what's your view to Omnichannel? Would you, do you think brands should actually just start across the board or do you think it's better to sort of sniper approach? I think it's better to have a sniper a sniper approach, especially because I think different brands have different kind of communities, and so mm. often you'll you'll like have one, you know, channel that works better. Like as an example, obviously TikTok, you know, uh, was huge in the last like eighteen months, but at the same time, it depends on who your customer base is, and so mm. I think being aware of that. But that said, I do think that once you get to about ten million in revenue, mm. you're gonna find that one channel is not enough anymore. But at that point in time, you would assume you'd have a bigger team, and then you start diversifying your portfolio effectively of presence. But that's the reason why we're big believers in like brand owned communities because as you do those things, you're building also your own community yep. and you're not depending on that channel. Like like the, the best example, absolutely. I mean, obviously there's a lot of discussions in the creators world about TikTok because like what if TikTok gets banned in the US and in, in Europe? Well, a lot of people have invested all their energy in building their following on TikTok. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone, right? And and that happened with Vine and and like, it can definitely happen. And so I think understanding that ultimately you need to own your relationships and you need to own your data, both for creators and influencers, but especially for brands, I think, I think is something that people are going to realize more and more. And you can't, like, you can't depend on, you know, it's, it's like building, like investing all your money into a store and not having a lease and knowing that they could just pull the plug on your store basically <laughs> sure. like in six months, yeah. then why would you invest that money? And, yeah, and that absolutely. risk is real. And so, like, if I were a brand, I would be, I would be scared of that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I asked one of our clients the other day, coming into, like, COVID, for example, what is your one, not, not regret, but if you could go back with the knowledge now, what would you do? And he said, I would pay probably threefold what I make in revenue to acquire each customer. Because he said, as soon as you went into COVID, the yeah. thing I needed then, he said, is I needed customer data, customer loyalty, and he said it's it's been harder since COVID. Um, I mean, we had Shopify on the podcast a couple of years back, and they said the first three months of COVID, on average per country, the number of stores doubled. Yeah, for three months. So they, you currently had ten competitors. You've now got twenty. Done. Yeah. And obviously they're startups. They're new, but they're going to catch up, and they're going to be more nimble than a bigger company. So. Y- I think in terms of that competitiveness, building that community, as you say, is so important. And But I think equally, I think you've touched on a really interesting point and a really good place to end, actually, is um, owning that community and owning that platform. Um, I think you can't own... I, mean, I remember Facebook used to show to everybody, and then Facebook said, it's only going to be your top 5% now, and you have to pay to reach the other 95%. What's the point of having a following if you have to pay yeah. to reach them? I don't need the following. I have to pay either way. And I think Facebook really shot themselves in the foot with stuff like that. But, yeah. yeah, I totally agree. You've got to own it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Ethan, absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you. And final question from me quickly. How can people reach out? What Rare Circles, how can they reach out to you guys and, uh, and have a conversation? Yeah, I mean, they can find us at rarecircles.com, uh, book a demo, but they can also find me directly if they want to speak to me at Mr. Ethan Song on Twitter. Lovely stuff. Well, Ethan, thank you for joining us today. And for everybody else listening again at home, um, we'll be back again probably in a few days because I know what date this one's going to go out. So it'll be in a few days. Um, and you will, uh, it's a completely new topic, but you might hear a couple of quotes from today in the next episode as well because I've already recorded that one, so I know what's coming. But lovely to have you with us. Please tune in again. Um, and also, if you haven't hit the subscribe button, make sure you hit that. See you again next week. Mm-hmm.